Hello. Today it's oscillators. So we'll look at a couple of things. Give you a quick introduction to crystal oscillators, to voltage controlled oscillators, partly also digitally controlled oscillators, and then introduce the concept of relaxation oscillators. So crystal oscillators you will find in most products, in watches, in anything that has a radio, anything that needs precise frequency. You will see on the PCB there will be a small tin can, I don't know if it's tin, <laughs> a small uh, metal thing, and maybe it has a frequency written on it, like this, 27 something hertz. I'm not sure what the uh, 0A means. But inside this metal box there is a piece of uh, crystal, so like a quartz crystal. And the thing about crystal, they use the piezoelectric uh, effect, piezoelectric effect, which is an effect where mechanical forces sets up an electrical field and an electrical field can set up mechanical forces. Now, the different types of modes that a crystal can resonate in are depending on the crystal or depending on the material structure. But in general, you can actually induce mechanical resonation or resonation, uh, mechanical resonance by applying an uh, electric field, by applying energy into the system. The cool thing about crystals is the frequency is mostly determined by the structure of the actual crystal and the material. So the resonance frequency can be extremely precise. The model that we use for crystals is usually something like looks like looks like this. Let me go full screen. So we model the mechanical resonator, this crystal, as a parasitic capacitance. Let me just find a better. Uh, okay, that's fine. So we model the mechanical resonator as a capacitor in bet parallel between the two pins. So crystals always have two pins and ground. And then we have a large inductor in series with a resistance. So there is some loss in the system and a small capacitance. Now when you compute the input impedance of the crystal, then usually when we then assume uh, zero resistance, so that there's no loss in the system, we get a transfer function that looks like this. And a couple of things you can observe is that there are multiple poles here. There is one at uh, DC because of the capacitor, so the impedance goes towards infinite at uh, low frequency. But then there will be a couple of other uh, poles also where well, I guess it's a zero and a pole, uh, where we can get the resonance. Now, since this uh, 1 over SCP doesn't really matter for the frequency that we're interested in, we can actually simplify it and see at, at resonance, the impedance is given by this uh, function. And I would encourage you to have a look in the crystal oscillator impedance for sort of a detailed explanation. Uh, we'll go through that in the lecture, how to calculate the uh, impedance and show what it means. But if you plot this impedance as a function of frequency, then you will see there are two sort of resonance uh, points. One is for the series resistance, or series resonance. The second is for the parallel resonance. Now. Both of these are quite close in frequency, but the thing is, the parallel resonance, that's usually where we operate crystal oscillators, and the resonance at that point can be extremely precise. So you can see the x-axis here. It is purely determined by the crystal. We can change the uh, resonance frequency a little bit by changing uh, 
the parasitic capacitance on the two pins of the crystal, but it doesn't change much. So crystals can create a very precise frequency. However, we need some energy. We need something to make it resonate. It won't just produce a frequency on its own. You have to either physically knock it or you have to electrically knock the system. And that's due to the this sort of series resistance model here. Eventually, the oscillations of the crystal will die out. So we have to continue to pump energy into the crystal. One way to do that is using something called a Pierce uh, inverter. So here we use an inverter that is self-biased uh, by a large resistor R1. And here the voltages at the input will go one way and of course at the output this sort of twisted 180 degrees so it, it will opposite um, oscillate with the opposite phase. This uh, negative GM, that is to compensate for the loss in the crystal. And we need that in order for the oscillation to start. Um, the, GM, the negative GM needs to be quite large for the oscillation to build up. It can't be exactly the same as the loss uh, due to the, the uh, series resistance in the crystal. It needs to be larger. Now the oscillations for a crystal, since the system has such a precise resonance frequency, it takes a long time to start up. It can be milliseconds. Now for IoT-based systems, that can be an, uh, a disadvantage because usually you want to sleep and then you wake, want to wake up quickly and you want to do something, send packets on the radio or do other things that require a precise frequency. And then the startup time on these crystals, that actually becomes a design issue. So as I said, you can fine tune the crystal frequency with parasitic capacitances. There is a good description in the um, links at the end of the slides to a introduction to crystal oscillators written by, I think that also was uh, Besad Al-Zawi. So on our integrated circuits, circuit, we have to make the inverter, the resistors, everything that we need in order to drive the crystal while the crystal itself and the capacitors, well, they can actually be internal also, but the crystal itself, that needs to be on the PCB. There are examples of manufacturing technologies where you can actually put, not a crystal, but a MEMS resonator, which is a sim sing, uh, similar <laughs> uh, resonator. It's not using crystal-like quartz, it's then using just a beam in vacuum that oscillates at a certain frequency due to, uh, I guess, the material that it's made of and so on. But that's also possible to Im implement on chip. So you can actually put it on top of your die. Or you can have different type of modes here. There are also sort of bulk acoustic wave resonators that produce standing waves in some sort of material. Those can also be integrated not necessarily in the same CMOS technology as the integrated circuit, but inside the package. When it comes to the temperature stability of crystals, that's really why we use them. When we are looking for accuracies of, I don't know, plus minus 50 ppm or even more accurate than that uh, frequencies, then crystals are one of the cheap choices. It's not zero cost because we have to have external components but it's not too bad if you want to have extremely precise oscillators then you need to go to uh, like rubidium uh, oscillators that use the hyperfine splitting of uh, some energy levels of rubidium and that is you can actually comp uh, you can actually use quantum mechanics to compute what the energy difference is. And since you know the energy difference, you will also know the frequency of oscillation. And those can be ridiculously precise. That's what we call atomic clocks. When we look at the crystal oscillation or resonance frequency across temperature, which in effect turns into the, to the oscillation frequency, it turns out that the um, 
temperature characteristics depends on the angle that you cut the crystal in. Which means that crystals come in different cost variants. As you try and make a crystal that is closer and closer to a zero temperature coefficient, so the, basically the frequency doesn't change with temperature, then I guess the precision of the angle matters, so they're more expensive. Or maybe you cut a bunch of devices and you test which ones are good over temperature. So if you're looking for crystals that are sort of plus minus 10 ppm, I don't know if they exist. They probably do, but uh, they would be quite expensive. But this sort of, uh, I guess we should call it a almost an S-curve, <laughs> so sort of a third order temperature gradient. That is what we expect from crystal, but it doesn't change much. And this allows us to have a fixed reference that is good enough for, for example, Bluetooth. When we have the frequency reference, then we can generate any frequency we want with a phase lock loop. But we need some sort of controlled oscillators. So I wanna give an introduction to the different types there. You should, well, you've probably seen the uh, ring oscillator before. It is at least three inverters. And I think here actually, it's a good idea to use primary numbers. Because if you have a primary number of stages, then you cannot have sustained harmonic oscillation inside the uh, inside the loop, I think. But if you want to figure out the frequency of oscillation of ring oscillator, well, we could simplify it a bit and say that the delay of a single inverter, that's roughly given by a time constant, an RC. Because every time we go higher or we go low, we're charging the capacitance in, for example, the output node here. And the capacitance that we see there will be a combination of the parasitic capacitance from the drain of the previous uh, NMOS and PMOS, and it'll be the gate source capacitance that we see from the next stage. So in these equations, it's a horrible simplification, but it's going to give you some insight. So the resistance of, for example, the NMOS when it's pulling down, that's going to be roughly assuming it's in the uh, in it's in strong inversion. Then the transconductance of that device is going to give, be given by mu n c ox w over l um, times the VDD minus the threshold voltage. So that means that the transconductance will vary with the supply voltage and the threshold voltage. And also, if we look across temperature, then, well, Cox doesn't change, WL doesn't change, VDD might be constant, but the threshold voltage will decrease with temperature and the mobility will increase with temperature. So depending on how you scale your transistors and sort of where it operates, and actually also the VDD, you will have a temperature coefficient that, that varies across frequency for the GM. For the um, capacitance, well, here I've assumed it's only the gate source capacitance that matters. So sort of uh, two thirds C ox W times L. So it's the gate source capacitance of the next stage. That's also a gross simplification, but yeah, it's close enough. When we then calculate the uh, delay of a single cell, we can see that we can simplify uh, some of the variables here. So W drops away and L goes into the top. And if we then look at the frequency of the ring oscillator, well, that will be one over two. So you have 180 degree phase change per inverter. So you need two inverters to invert, uh, well, to get a full period. So that's one over two TPD, and then it's the number of stages. Which means that the uh, oscillation frequency is given by the mobility, VDD minus uh, the threshold voltage, divided by four thirds number of stages, times L squared. And L here is the length of the transistor. 
And from this, we can see that, okay, we can change the oscillation frequency as a linear function of EDD, assuming the device is mostly in strong inversion. The oscillation frequency will also change with temperature, depending on how the threshold voltage and the mobility changes with temperature. And for PLL design, we could also compute a KVCO, so the derivative of the frequency as a function of the uh, controlled node, or the VDD in this case, and the 2 pi, that's just convention. So we can see that the KVCO will be given by the mobility and divided by the length squared. So that means that in ring oscillators, if you want a low K KVCO, then you should make your transistors long. And, well, mobility, it's a bit unfair here because I've assumed that the mobility of NMOS and PMOS is the same. It is not. Um, so... This is a gross oversimplification, but it sort of shows the idea. We have a relationship to length squared. We have a relationship to mobility of both INMOS and PMOS, and not much else. But of course, maybe we can't get the KVCO low enough, or we can't get the frequency low enough for three inverters. Well, then we can change the frequency by increasing the number of inverters. Or we can change the length of uh, the devices. That will also decrease our oscillation frequency. It's also possible to add capacitance to every node. So we can add a second capacitor to every node. And that changes our equations a bit. So no longer is necessarily the uh, capacitance seen at the output of an inverter dominated by the CGS of the next stage, it might actually be the capacitors that we add. And if it's the capacitors that we add, then assuming here that C is much larger than two-thirds C ox WL, then the whole equation simplifies and uh, we no longer have an L squared relationship, we have a L relationship, so one over L uh, for the uh, KVCO and for the frequency. Now, when you want to make a realistic, like an actual ring oscillator, it's a good idea to have a ring oscillator that is a bit more well-controlled. First of all, when it comes to the VDD node, when we reduce the VDD on the ring oscillator, let's assume, for example, that we're reducing VDD here, at some point, the ring oscillator will stop functioning because the VDD is too low. There's not enough... Uh, there's not enough voltage for it to be able to oscillate. And that's not good. That destroys our, our control loop. We want the oscillator in a phase lock loop to oscillate at roughly the right frequency. We just want to do fine adjustments to the frequency. And the PLL should do that. So one way to do a more controlled oscillator is to feed it via a current mirror. So here, the rise time of node C for PMOS will be determined by the current. So we get an I, well, the, the V, the change in voltage as a function of time, uh, will be given by I divided by C. And if we know I, then we compute, can compute C. Sorry, uh, the DVDT. Assuming the uh, inverter flips mid-rail, then we can get an estimate of the frequency. Now, here, since we actually want to control the oscillation frequency with the voltage, we could add a parallel branch for with uh, maybe long devices, long PMOS devices, to add or subtract, or not subtract, but add a little bit of current um, to each ring oscillator. So that allows us to tune the current flowing into the inverter, which will tune the rising edge of each of the stages. It won't control the falling edge, so the NMOS will still be quite strong, but this allows us to tune the frequency over a narrower range. Uh, 
So if you wanted to try a ring oscillator, start with something like this. It's also possible to do symmetric, so you could actually feed in current mirrors on both sides, but it could become just a bit more complicated than you have sort of a floating ring oscillator. Uh, but try this first. We can also change the ring oscillator into a digitally controlled oscillator. And one way to do that is to change the capacitance. So by changing the capacitive load on the output of every single stage, we can actually digitally control the oscillation frequency. And there are many other ways to do the control loops or the control node. Now, one thing I want you to think about is we don't have to make single-ended uh, ring oscillators, so single inverter. We can also make ring oscillators with amplifiers, particularly differential amplifiers. So for a ring oscillator, we need three stages. For a differential amplifier connected as an oscillator, we can get away with two stages. I want you to think about why, and let's discuss in the lecture. But generally, differential oscillators ha can have better power supply re rejection ratio, so they're less sensitive to power noise. Inverters, for example, here, if we're driven directly from VDD, it's extremely sensitive to power noise. Here, it's kind of controlled, so that the voltage at each of the powers here, well, it's still actually dependent on VDD for the um, final parts of the settling, but most of it is going to be current controlled. But have a think. How can we make, uh, how can we get oscillation with only two amplifiers? Now, if ring oscillators don't work, if they're too noisy, if we can't get the phase noise down enough. If they're too sensitive to supply noise, anything like that, then, or if they're too power hungry, because ring oscillators are quite power hungry, we have lots of capacitors being charged up and down, then, then we need to go to LC oscillators. And on every single chip that contains a radio, I'm pretty sure you're going to see w at least one inductor, and that one inductor is likely going to be the voltage-controlled oscillator in the radio PLL. And the inductors, those are physically large, so we don't want to use them where we don't have to, but sometimes the resonance frequency that we get from um, an L and a couple of capacitors can be tuned quite accurately. So. Uh, here, the frequency of oscillation of the LC tank, that's 1 over the square root of uh, LC, or proportional to that. So if we have a fixed inductor, here I actually have two inductors feeding in current uh, at the midpoint in the inductor. And then we have a couple of capacitors. Now the capacitors, those, those can actually be trims, like uh, we can have a capacitor bank and we can change the uh, size of capacitors to do sort of coarse calibration of the oscillation frequency. And then we could use varactors, so variable capacitors, to give us a fine control of the oscillation frequency in a phase lock loop. Now, the key thing about any LC tank is that if you just induce a voltage, it will ring. But depending on the um, resistance in the LC tank, the oscillations will die out. They will be decrease with time. In order to prevent that, we use, again, a negative GM to sustain the oscillations. We're still providing energy into the system. Now, LC oscillators can get a very um, low phase noise at low current. And it is the design you'll find in radios. Now, there's an infinite number of ways to control the uh, capacitance that the LC tank sees, or indeed uh, 
uh, the negative GM, it can be like this, just with the cross-coupled NMOS pair, or you can have cross-coupled PMOS pair. And if you're interested in these kind of topics, then go to IEEE Explorer, search for uh, PLL designs or radio designs, and quite often you will find the different types of LC, oscill LC oscillators. These days also, you also find quite a lot of uh, analog our all digital PLLs. And in all digital PLLs, we don't use a voltage controlled oscillator, we use a digitally controlled oscillator. And then we replace the uh, varactors with just a capacitor bank, where we have a bunch of capacitors that we can tune in and out with a digital signal. Now, there's one other type of oscillator that I, I'd like you to know about, and that is what's called a relaxation oscillator or RC oscillator. And that could also mean resistance capacitance uh, oscillator. So, I don't want to explain this now. And the reason for that is I want you to think about it. So based on what you see on this picture, try to prove for yourself that the oscillation frequency at FO is 1 over 2 RC. And then we can discuss more in detail in the lecture. These are the links. A lot of the phase lock loop design is in the oscillator. You get the oscillator right, you have your KVCO, then the rest of the PLL can fall into place, although of course there are challenges other places also. But it's sort of the heart. It's one of the most important blocks in a PLL. Okay, thanks.